light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine first peter first peter chapter one and first peter chapter two will be where we begin this morning so if you'll go ahead and turn there you know, it's important for us to realize that these are, <coughs> excuse me, these are letters. These are letters that were written by men to people. People that are part of the church. People that are part of the body of Christ, just like us. But the timing of when these are written is different than us today. That means that when these letters were written, they were written for that specific purpose to pass along some wisdom that God had inspired these men like Peter to the, to the Christians that are uh, scattered abroad, as we're going to see here in just a second. And with that being said, there are little hints and there are little clues that, that they know that are very accustomed to them. Key words that when you would write this, they would automatically think back to that. Or certain phrases that when you would read, when those Christians would read them, that they knew exactly what God had intended for them to know, but they would also think back of a pattern and maybe some things that happened in history to help them fully understand exactly what was going on at the time. Now, we don't have that benefit of full context today. We can read it. We can try to understand it. But we didn't live in that type of environment. But still, nonetheless, God has intended these letters to be read to us. He's intended these biblical books, these, these epistles as they're called, to be written to us as well so that we can learn and that we can pattern our lives and find out the message that God had to share with the early church and how that message is still relevant for us today. And the message here in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and 2 is very relevant today. As we look at the theme, better together. That's our theme for the month here. Looking at seeking to try to be better, just a little bit better than we have been. So when we read phrases, I want you to see who this letter's written to. <clears throat> I want you to see the purpose of why it was written and some of the words that are used. Beginning in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. You see his audience as it's written to those who are elect exiles who are brought about by the dispersion or the scattering abroad into these areas. It's written to Christians that are in these areas and he calls them being scattered about or about that dispersion or, and elect exiles to let them know that they're living in a place that's not really their home. Now we know the spiritual implications of that. This world is not our home, but there's a physical explanation of that as well as you read because they're really living in a place as Christians that is not really connected to where their spiritual heritage is in Jerusalem. Their spiritual heritage there is in Jerusalem as Jews with the temple that's there and with all of the, the things that would go on there. And now they're living in a certain area of the world that is not there. And he says, you're, you're living about, according to the dispersion, you're living out in these areas. I want you to know some things that since you're out there that's going to help you stay focused, stay on task. And then he goes into chapter 2 and he says, You are living stones built up as a spiritual house, which Jesus is the chief cornerstone, that you are these living stones. And we're going to get back to that, talking about these stones in just a second. Built up as a spiritual house. And even though you are not in Jerusalem, your homeland, even though you're scattered over here, you still have a home wherever Jesus is. Jesus is that cornerstone. You still have a temple. Although it's not the one that is, 
is made of stone and, and brick. This temple is made of living stones. It's made of a, of a house that you reside in that is within you. And each of you together make up these living stones. And all of us here, we are built up as a spiritual house, as a temple, as a place of worship to God, even as we're here this morning. But when I see the word stones, and when I see the word living in front of it, those living stones and spiritual house, the Jews would automatically think of certain things. They would automatically think of the temple. They would automatically, that spiritual house, that's what that was to them. The temple was the spiritual house. And when you would think of living stones, they would think of going back to the days of Ezra, as we mentioned this morning, and Nehemiah, when those places are being rebuilt after being destroyed. And using the phrases like exiles, sojourners, you would automatically, as a Jew, think back to the captivity of Babylon. You would think about how things were back then and what Peter is trying to tell them, that you guys, even though you're not in Babylonian captivity anymore, we're still held captive. We're still held captive by sin, and we're trying to get you to know that the spiritual house that you have within yourselves is built up with Jesus as that cornerstone that can relieve that slavery from you and bondage, and you can be free. Doesn't matter what kind of persecution you must be facing because you faced it in Babylon. You face it today even as well. Even if you look at the end of chapter 5 of 1 Peter, you're going to read where Peter cites those people that are living in Babylon. But Babylon's been destroyed centuries before. He's talking about Rome. He's using that symbolic language to let them know this spiritual house. Now when I was looking for a passage, a lesson that had to do with better together. I wanted really hard to use this passage in 1 Peter, I want, and, and sec, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, about these living stones and how we're being built up. But, and I told myself, because it seems like I'd preached on uh, a, a passage uh, several months ago that I said, I don't want to go there because I know that I've already had that on my mind. I want to go in a different direction to kind of lead people in a different direction to kind of give them another lesson. But guys, the more I tried... The more I tried to, and I know this sounds bad, to avoid a certain passage for preaching it twice in a year, I couldn't. Because when I kept looking at this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 about living stones, everything about it kept pointing me back to Nehemiah. Everything about it kept pointing me back to the passage of Nehemiah when Nehemiah gets back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and how they're going to do it brick by brick as these living stones. And I have left my remote, so just pause, don't move. Everybody stay still. Nobody leave. Play. <laughs> living stones, these brick by brick to being built up as a spiritual house. These Jews that are receiving this message in 1 Peter, their mind has to go back to that when Nehemiah comes back. Has to be reminiscent of the Babylonian captivity. That's a major part of their life. Even though they didn't experience it themselves, it's going back to their ancestors. It's a major part of their environment and who they are. It's deeply rooted in their history of going into Babylon and being held captive for the Jews. Sure, some of these are Gentile Christians. But as these Jews read it, they understand. So I want you to go. As we look at this being better together, I want you to go to Nehemiah with me. Because as these living stones, as that's what we are, we're going to build our spiritual house. We're going to build it brick by brick, brick by by brick, and the task that we have in an environment today is just as difficult to build that house as it was back then. As the early church begins to start, these people are facing persecution. Now their persecution is, is of their lives. They're being faced with death. Now many of us, we're not having to face that, but other parts of the world, they are. We're having to face maybe our rights being taken away as Christians and not being able to do that. But if you look at it from God's mindset, he doesn't care about our political rights because he knows we have rights in him. 
We have these inalienable rights that he has given to us to be Christians. And no matter what the political system, no matter what the culture of the day, no matter what the environment, we can still live godly lives building our spiritual house in an environment that will be able to withstand anything that comes against it. So as we look at being better together, let's look at some things from Nehemiah 2 and 3 that can help us be better together. How we can build this spiritual house brick by brick. How we can do this together. In Nehemiah chapter 2, we, we know, well, let's, let's back up. We know that Nehemiah goes back and he hears about the walls and how the walls are destroyed. So he solicits to the king to go and to go back to home, his homeland and rebuild these walls. And we know from Josephus, we don't know exactly how big the walls were in Nehemiah's day. But we know from Josephus' day that in some places that the wall was 15 feet thick. All right, 15 feet thick. We know that it reached at some points 23 feet tall. Remember, it's, the walls are noted for protection. That's what they're for. And not only that, it went for about four and a half to five miles. That's how far it stretched. So when you look at the task that Nehemiah's get, God, he's got to repair these walls. In some places, he's got to build it completely back up. It's a task that seems very difficult, seems impossible. And as you look in chapter 2, beginning in verse... Chapter 2, verse 12. Look at chapter 2, verse 12, and let's read together as he, what he sees. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one of what my God had put into my heart to do in Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night to the valley of the gate, or by the valley gate, to the dragon spring, to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that they were broken, and its gates had been laid and destroyed by fire. Then I went to the fountain gate, to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up by night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I, re I turned back and entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest of those who were with me to the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble that we're in now. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. As we look at this solicitation by Nehemiah to the people there to encourage them to build together, to build back, he knows that they must work together and there are four things that we can use from his lesson. The first thing as we go brick by brick. When doing God's work, everybody's needed. As we build our spiritual house up. And yes, our, our house looks good. I mean, we do have some good things going on here. We have a lot of great programs. We have a lot of great efforts. A lot of great teachers. A lot of great men and women that are and a great leadership and great deacons that are work. We have a lot of great things going. But there are still holes in our wall. Just as there are every congregation. And individually, if you want to look at your own spiritual house, yourself, there's still holes there. You may be pretty good, but there's still some holes that need to be repaired. And through this passage, God wants us to see that when you're doing God's work, when you're trying to repair these problems, or to fix these issues, or to make yourself better, everybody's needed. Everybody has a job to do. Everybody has a purpose to fulfill. Now, it's Make no mistake, God doesn't need us. Okay, God is not thinking, if I don't have my people work, the plan's going to fail. If God is not in heaven thinking that these, you've got to do your job, if you don't pull your weight, then the whole thing is over, it flops. I need you to do this. It's not God. But God can use us. And God desires us to have a part so that it does work. And if we don't, our part will fail. But it won't be because of God, it will be because of us. 
You see, God has left us with a responsibility. He doesn't need us to save mankind, but he needs us to share the gospel. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission, it's our job. God chose human beings to be the method of making the message known to everybody, to carry out the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And I'm going to be with you always until the end of the world. He says, but I want you to go and teach people. You baptize them. You teach them the things that I've commanded you. That's our responsibility is to go through that. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're told, verse 10, that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he before prepared that we should walk in and that he had has some things for us to do. And it's not just a few of us. It's all of us. And when we look at the text here in Nehemiah chapter 3, we're going to see the phrase. You, you can pick it up. I've underlined the first one in verse 2. Next to him, the men of Jericho. Next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri. Verse 4. Next to them, next to them, next to them, verse 5. Verse 6, next to them, and 7. You can see how it goes over and over and over again. The phrase, next to them, if you want to write this down, next to him, or next to them, or after him, is used 30 times in chapter 3, and chapter 3 is only 32 verses. He's letting us know that the only way this insurmountable task that they had was going to be completed is if they were working next to each other, that everybody had a responsibility to play. Everybody had a role to fulfill if they're going to use that brick by brick. See, our walls here include things like evangelism, where they had maybe this gate or that gate. We have evangelism. We have edification. We have trying to maintain our daily study. We have our home devos that we're doing, encouraging people to have home Bible studies every night with their family. Some encouragement that we're providing for others, that we have all of these things, all of these gates. We have the reach out ministry that we have with our Christ over cancer. And if we want all of these other things to work, our education program, which, by the way, we are needing teachers right now, and every one of you are needed to help teach our children. When we look at all of these roles that we have, to, all of these gates that need to be repaired or maintained, it takes all of us to do it. It's not just about those people at the congregation that are leaders or that are paid to or, or that feel better suited for that, that we all have a responsibility to be next to him. And if you don't feel like you can do it on your own, that's why you have someone next to you and next to them so that together you can work God's plan, God's method for us to build up this, this house of living stones. If we're going to do this, Doing God's work means that every, every person is needed. But doing God's work also means that, that everybody has a niche. There's a niche for everyone. Now, that, that, you know what that word means. I want to define it for you. It means a place, employment, status, or activity for which a person or thing is best fitted. Everybody's got their niche. Everybody's got their place where they're better suited. For instance, when we look at our ministry here, Christ over cancer, who better suited to help run that than Marty? When we look at our ministry of, of, that we have of technology and our website and our streaming service, who better suited for that than Mark? Where their backgrounds are, where their life has been and their experiences when we see how these ministries work and different things of the, of the gospel that's played out for us to build up the spiritual house, each one of us have a role to play. Everybody's important. We've all got a purpose to uphold. We've all got a job to do because there is a niche for everybody here. And there's a place, there's a, a plan, a, a place of environment of work for you that's best suited according to your interest. Now look at Nehemiah chapter 3 and it's going to play out there. The very first group that works. Listen to chapter 3, verse 1. Then Elishib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers and priests, and they built the sheep gate. 
They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated as far as the tower of a hundred, as far as the tower of Hanel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to him, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. The priest. The priest repaired the sheep gate. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, the sheep gate was the gate by which they would bring the animals through. They would bring the animals through if they were bringing through, maybe to herd them through, but primarily they would brought forth so they would know which animals to sacrifice. Who better to know, who better to work in the place where the animals that are going to be coming through for sacrifice to make sure it flows well, to make sure it's easy for these animals to pass, to make sure it be best suited for them so they could select the sacrifices out of there and, and carry them to be slaughtered on that altar for the people. Who better to do that than the high priest? You think, well, what kind of job could the high priest do? They're supposed to be sanctified. They're supposed to be only the ones be going into the, the holiest of holies and to offer these sacrifices. They're not construction workers. They're not builders. If you look at their garments as described in the book of Exodus, they're white. All right? It's not something that you would go off and wear to go do construction. But as they wear their garments, as they do their job of priests, they're also doing the job of repairing and building the sheep gate because the sheep gate was the one gate that they had the most interest in. You've got an interest, you've got a place, you get to find it, you got to use it. That's when we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want to look at that for just a second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. For just as the body is one in many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For there is one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all made to drink of the same Spirit. As we continue to read, verse 27, Now the body of Christ and is individually members of it. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing, helping, administration, various kinds of tongues. All are, aren't all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. All those were gifts, those spiritual gifts that God gave them for the furtherance of the kingdom to let people know about Jesus. And most of those gifts there, they've already been done away with. First Corinthians chapter 13, those miraculous gifts they're done away with. He says, I've got higher gifts that are for you. And you have those gifts. And they're based according to your desires and your interest and your niche. Just where your niche is. And you got to find it. Because these niches that we have, they fit a certain role. If you look through Nehemiah 3, you're going to find that there were goldsmiths. They would melt the gold down, they would shape it, and that's what the goldsmith would do. That was his job. That's where his interest was. You would have governors. Surely they had some sort of, of organization skills with them. They had somebody that had to be a governor, somebody that had to be uh, the politician to go by and explain and tell people and manage and, and be able to, to, uh, to run the organization of how things were to be done. There were merchants you had to go buy and purchase things. You had to trade things off. If you needed this, you had to go. They didn't have a Lowe's or a Home Depot to go to. You had to do these certain things with the merchants. Then they had, if you'll notice when you're reading, perfumers. Well, what in the world's a perfumer got to do with it? You ever worked outside? Did not shower for days? Working out in the sun, knowing what you got to do? I'm sure the place was not the most appealing to smell. But the perfumers had a role to play. That was their job to make things at least somewhat pleasant. Everybody's got a role, church. Everybody. In doing God's work, we got to bring our necks. Now, that's a little unusual, but you'll notice when you'll read, go back to Nehemiah 3 and you'll see. Nehemiah 3, verse 5, And next to him the Tekoites repaired 
but their nobles did not stoop to serve their Lord. That's the ESV. The, the King James language and the New King James read this, that they, the Tekoites, their nobles, would not bring their necks. Bringing your neck meant that you fully supported the work that you were going to be able to give it 110%. It meant that they were going to the work, the Tekoites, they had a place that they were, they were going to work. They were set over here in this area, verse 5 says, to work. Next to him, the Tekoites, they repaired, but their nobles, the ones that were noble among the Tekoites, they were not willing to put their back into it. They were not knowing, willing to give it all. So if you're coming to work the work of God, you can't come halfway. you got to be willing to put your neck into it, to put your body into it, to put your spirit, your heart into it, to give it everything that you've got. Now, you'll notice that the Kohite nobles, they didn't want to work here. They were like, no, 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 we, that's, we don't want to do that. We, we don't want to do that aspect of the work. But you can look on over in the book of Nehemiah, and you can, you can find out later on that they're going to have their job to be fulfilled. They're going to have something that they have to work. Chapter 3, verse 27 says that the Tekoites, they went and they did this. So they weren't going to do this, but they brought them over and still used them, didn't give up on them at all, so that they could work over here. If we're going to get involved in this, building together, helping together, the living stones, we've got to put our necks out. We've got to put our backs in it. We can read all throughout the New Testament and have the same principle in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, and then verse 23 and follow, whatever your hand find it to do, do it with all your might. Do it heartily to the Lord. Everything that you do, you put forth the effort, you do it as you're doing it to God. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about how you never visited me or you, when I was naked and you didn't clothe me and, and all of those, in, I was in prison, you didn't come and see me, all of those different things. He says every time you do something, you do it as though you're doing it to me. We're building this house for God, not ourselves. And only then when we, could, when we see that, we'll be able to put our, be use our necks, to put our necks into it. The last part here, when doing God's work, everybody's got to be aware of the goal. Everybody's got to have, be on the same page if this is going to work. Nehemiah expressed that goal in chapter 2 where he told all those people, this is what we're going to do. Man interviewed three bricklayers. They were interviewing for a job and they asked the bricklayers about the work, the same bricklayers, they were working on the same project and they asked them what they were doing with the project. And one bricklayer said, well, I'm just laying brick. One by one, I'm laying brick. They interviewed the second bricklayer. He said, you know what, I'm, I'm feeding my family. What are you doing out here working? Well, I'm feeding my family. One guy, I'm brick by brick, I'm building. The other guy, I'm feeding my family. They interviewed the third guy. He said, what are you doing on this job as a bricklayer? He said, I'm building a great cathedral for people to come and worship. And you tell me which one of those got the job, you think? When he had the end goal in mind, he took more pride in his work. Instead of just being a daily routine, we've got to know the goal. We've got to put that goal out there for us all to know. And our goal is simple. We want to go to heaven. Yes, we want to please God. Yes, we want to make sure we do the best that we can to be better. Henry Cloud, in his book, Boundaries for Leaders, many of you are familiar with his books, uh, uh, Safe People, uh, things like that. He has several books of boundaries for people. Boundaries for leaders reads like this. What drives strong performance is a commitment to a shared vision and shared goals. Teams have to work together on the right things in the right ways at the right time for the same goal. Teamwork is only driven by a shared purpose or goal. For the leader specifically, he says, the job of a leader... The job of a leader is to form that team around a common purpose or goal and then to work with the team to figure out what the team is doing, to what the team is going to value and behave like to reach that goal. Everybody has to see the big picture. Everybody has to know the goal of what we're working towards. And if we all can see that goal as we build this living house 
of living stones, this body of the church, brick by brick, working side by side, everybody working in the area that suits them, that fits their interest, everybody putting their heart into it, building it, everybody having in mind the goal of building the best congregation of the Lord's church that we can possibly build. And if we all are doing that the right way, we're going, we're going to grow. Not only are we going to repair our problem areas, but we're going to be able to build bigger and bigger spiritually. See, there's this thing that's called the Pareto Principle. You've heard of it. You didn't even know you heard of it before, but you've heard of it. The Pareto Principle is this, and it comes from church work and the world. It says that 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. It means 80% of the work that's done in the church, specifically here, or at your business, that 80% of that work that's done is done by 20% of the people. Nehemiah's plan just blows that out of the water, doesn't it? It's not about the 80-20. It's about the 100 it's about everybody being on task for the same goal. If we want to be better together, we got to get on the wall and we got to get to work. And we work together side by side and we build brick by brick. And we put forth that effort with our heart, knowing the end result. And if we do that, we will be better together. Maybe you haven't been doing your part. Maybe you ain't even been on the wall. Maybe you've been like those nobles of Tekoa. You didn't want to put your back into it, your neck into it. You didn't want to put your heart into it. You didn't, that didn't interest you. Well, then let's just move you to somewhere else where you can be used. Because we've all got a job to play. We've all got a role to fulfill. So if you haven't been doing that work that you know you need to, here's your opportunity to fix it. Here's your opportunity to ask for forgiveness of not doing the stuff that you know you've been blessed to do. Or here is your opportunity to become part of the family of God and get to work in this building of living stones. Our Lord died for us. He shed his blood so that we could have this opportunity. Now it's our responsibility to do whatever we can for him. So you look at your life and see what you've been doing and if it doesn't measure up to this kind of pr principle, this kind of plan, then let's do something about it. This morning as we stand and sing the invitation song. Have thy shine, affection. Jesus, shine, fill this land with the fire.